Cassatt Podcast Network. Welcome to Season 5 of Cassatt Conversations, a holistic look at mental health. Join us for a series of thought-provoking conversations that delve into the vast dimensions of mental well-being. From the intricate link between physical, emotional, and spiritual aspects of well-being to the latest scientific research, practices, and therapies, we navigate the multifaceted landscape of mental health together. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Alessandro Soretti. Dr. Soretti is an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Bologna. Welcome, Dr. Soretti. So happy to have you here today. Thank you. So as we dive in, I'd love for you to just share a little bit about yourself and the work that you do. Yes, thank you. As you said, I'm an associate professor of psychiatry here at Bologna University. And my background is basically as a clinician, a psychiatrist, but I worked uh, since many years also in the genetic field. And therefore, I would say that my expertise is a combination of uh, clinical uh, research uh, and and genetic knowledge. Of course, I'm seeing patients and I'm trying to integrate all these aspects together. How did you get into genetics? What took you from psychiatry to genetics? Well, this is a difference between probably Europe and U.S., uh, where I know that in the U.S., uh, careers are clearly separated. Someone that is doing research usually is doing only research and clinicians as well. Here, uh, it's quite common to have a combination of activities. Um, Our time is by law divided in 50% clinical activity and 50% research and teaching. And therefore, it is my background since more than 30 years. Mm, I love that. That makes so much sense. I would imagine that your clinical practice informs your research and vice versa. Exactly. Wonderful. So I'd love for you to just paint a picture for us on the current landscape of the field of genetics and maybe even the intersection of psychiatry, too. That'll be helpful for our listeners. Yes, I understand that uh, for people that is not working in the field, genetics uh, is sometimes frightening or complex, uh, and and opinions uh, have usually a big variation uh, when when I talk with uh, people that is not working in this field. So let's start with some very basic findings, very basic facts about genetics. Genetics are, of course, the genes that we all have and that uh, constitute the basis for uh, everything that we have in our body. That is the brain, of course, but also the other parts of the body. And the the genes are not all the same for every person. And it's exactly in this variation that we are looking at the difference and try to understand the link with psychiatry, but not only psychiatry, the other fields of medicine, of course. The variation, the problem is that it's huge. Um, You should have in mind just a few numbers. We have 7 billion base pairs in our DNA. And they code for a lot of different proteins in a very different and complex way. Out of these 7 billion, we have more than 20 million variants, the common ones, and uh, another other million variants that are more rare. Rare, it means they're less than 1% of the population. So you can easily understand that there is a, a, a very challenging situation to understand which of these 20 million variants are responsible for what. And this is exactly with, which is the, the framework that we are working in and the genetic is working in. Point is that usually the people has, has knowledge of the so-called Mendelian disease. Mendelian disease are the very simple genetic diseases where one gene has a variation so important that gives uh, um, clinical consequences. And these are quite rare usually in the population and severe when they have, when they happen. <clears throat> these are the easy part of the genetic studies because one gene is altered and you have the disease. And these are known since many years. 
What is more challenging and interesting, and is of course with much more broad interest, are the complex diseases. Complex diseases means that a lot of genes, a lot means hundreds or even more, interact in a combined way to give liability to the disease. So today we are mainly talking of this second part because it's more relevant for us, because the simple Mendelian diseases are already known and are treated by physicians at everyday basis. Of course, this is raising a large interest because it affects all diseases in a different degree, but all of them, psychiatric, cardiology, internal medicine diseases, and so on. And this is why the landscape now is, is, is very exciting. There are this large consortia, one of the largest is called Psychiatric Genetic Consortium, PGC, that is collecting samples all over the world, uh, Western and uh, Asia and Africa, and putting together uh, hundreds of thousands, and they are reaching also millions of samples together. It's quite possible now to understand all these complex in interactions. And we are starting to have the first clinical applications. Um, I'm just thinking about cardiology. In cardiology, it's possible now to use the so-called uh, polygenic uh, scores uh, to predict some risk of myocardial infarction or other aspects. And clinicians are already using these scores, but maybe we will detail this a little bit uh, more uh, more later. Oh, thank you for painting that picture. It's so helpful. I do find genetics a little overwhelming, especially, you know, I mean, you're talking about 7 billion, you know, 7 billion, 20 million. I mean, it's just, and the complexity of it. Um, and so I'm glad there's people like you who understand it and are looking at it, because uh, I think it's critically important. Uh, how often is the landscape changing? It seems like there's every week there's some new finding in the news. It's what it feels like. I don't know if that's true. Uh, but how often is that landscape changing? Yes. Uh, also here, it's it's important to have uh, um, a little bit of, of, of background and, and frame to understand what is happening. For many years, and many, I mean about 20, 30 years, uh, uh, we, we, I mean researchers, were looking at uh, single genes. And so I remember 20 years ago, 25 years ago, it was very common, uh, for example, at the beginning of the 1991, 92, that some genes were discovered. And this confused a lot the population, because I remember also the newspaper, they were reporting, oh, uh, the gene of bipolar disorder has been discovered. And people was, of course, very happy about that. Point is that it was not true. A single gene cannot be responsible for a complex disorder, as we said just a few minutes ago. Gene for bipolar disorder, gene for schizophrenia, the gene of depression is, is not possible a single gene. So for more than 20, 30 years, uh, some of these results were popping up and the, the, the general press was covering these findings uh, and reporting, oh, discover the gene, discover the gene. And the population was confused because nothing happened after that. Of course, uh, everybody was expecting, okay, now that we have discovered the gene, we can find a cure, we can find a better treatment, but it was not happening. Why? because the finding was not replicated, because the disorder is complex. And only later we realized that it's not just one gene, but it's a combination of many genes. This is why the, the landscape changed dramatically in the last about 10 years uh, ago, where, when uh, there were different technologies that were able not only to look at a single gene, but to the whole genome. Probably everybody remembers that at the beginning of the, uh, this century, there was the report of first time the, the, the genetic code has been decoded uh, completely. Well, this was just the starting point, because since then, 
uh, all of us is able to access to the whole genome information and this boosted of course the research so much because now we can cover everything and also the computational power of uh, our uh, computers and, and clusters that are, we are using is, is able now to manage this complexity. So this was a single uh, long step uh, that uh, changed completely the landscape. And now we are able to look the whole genome in a powerful way in very large samples and now for the first time in history the findings that we are finding we i mean all researchers worldwide are there are replicated it's not like in the 90s where single gene was not replicated now just to give you an example uh, it has been reported that about 200 genes are uh, involved with the risk of schizophrenia and these 200 genes are consistently uh, replicated almost completely in all the populations. So now we are quite confident that these 200 genes have indeed a role in schizophrenia. But we understand that the population is so, has been so overwhelmed with uh, false uh, <laughs> hopes in the past that even now maybe they can be skeptical, but this is not the case. Now the situation is different. That makes so much sense. Thank you for giving us that history because I think it, for me, I know it helps because it's always like, well, I mean, really, I feel like we heard about this, you know, 10 years ago and now it's different. And so that definitely helps me understand a little bit more. Uh, so today's topic is really focused on how do genes influence our mental health? And so would love for you to give us some insight there. Yes, and this, of course, is, is the central point of, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of our work and, and what will happen. And here also it's important to have a little bit of a background about uh, how genes can influence the, the human behavior and the disease. Okay, we already said that uh, the many variants in the genome uh, produced are transcribed into proteins that can be different one person to another just think about the color of the eye or color of the skin and the same happens to the brain so our brain i mean the brain of each individual is different from another and this difference is largely due to the genetic background Maybe we will discuss a little bit uh, this later. Largely means in numbers from 40 to 80 percent controlled by genes. So different genes, hundreds, thousands of different genes create slightly different proteins that combine in uh, the architecture of the brain, neurons, uh, glial cells, uh, and communications uh, between uh, neurons in a different way. So some person may have, just an example, an amygdala. Amygdala is the structure in the brain that is responsible for anxiety, that gives us anxiety. That anxiety is not bad per se. We need anxiety. We need to escape when, uh, when a danger is close. So amygdala is there for anxiety. And some person have a genetically, uh, let's say, um, liable built amygdala that is more active. And this, those persons are, on average, more anxious. So this is a straightforward and clear example about how small variations in, in many genes can, at the end, create a structure in the brain, and this is the example of anxiety, that is giving a liability. So those persons with this genetically more anxious uh, amygdala, for example, are on average more alert, more anxious. And if there is a combination of environment, environment I mean education, uh, parenting, style, uh, stressful life events in childhood, and this can even further increment this liability to, for example, anxiety, but it is the same for depression and the other disorder. And then we may have the full-blown uh, picture of an anxiety disorder. Could be a 
panic disorder, could be generalized anxiety disorder. But one point that is very important not to be mistaken is that genetic is not a 100% prediction of what will happen. It's just a liability. So a person that is taller is more liable, and we know that, of some physical disorder like back pain. If you are very high, very tall, you are more liable to back pain and many other examples like that. So an amygdala that is genetically uh, more liable to anxiety doesn't mean 100% uh, you will have panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder, but you are more liable to it. So if a combination of environmental variables converge, then you can develop the picture. And this the same for depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar disorder. The structures are different. In depression, uh, structures involved are mainly some prefrontal cortex and uh, hippocampus. In schizophrenia, it's probably an issue of connectivity. In bipolar disorder, is even different. So the genetic background can orient a little bit the person into specific directions of liability of diseases. But you can have persons that have a strong uh, liability for disease but doesn't develop the disease. This is the example of uh, twins. Monozygotic twins are very uh, interesting in this, uh, in this aspect because monozygotic twins have the same genes, exactly the same. But the concordance means the rate of the disease uh, in, in monozygotic twins is not 100%. It's very high because, of course, they have the same liability, but it's not 100%. For example, in schizophrenia, the concordance is 60-80%. It means that uh, you can have uh, one twin that is suffering from schizophrenia and another twin that the same exactly genes is not suffering from schizophrenia. Why? Probably the combination of some environmental risk and protective factors that intervened during the development and the childhood of the subject. That makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the impact of lifestyle uh, and so the behaviors that a person does along with environment. Um, and you mentioned this percentage of 40 to 80% controlled by genes. And do you have a sense of the breakdown of the impact of health, beha you know, health behaviors, so lifestyle, environmental factors, genes, like that picture that's influencing? Exactly. I think this is very important for people that is not working in the field to, to know exactly how does it work. Uh, first, the contribution, the genetic contribution, uh, is uh, uh, variable across disorders. Some of them have a very strong uh, genetic contribution, always talking about complex disease, not Mendelian ones. Just to name two, uh, schizophrenia and the autism are the ones that have the highest contribution of genes. Some people estimate also to 80%. Other mental disorders have a much lower contribution of genetic factors. Just to name a couple, uh, depression and anxiety are much lower, uh, both below 40%. So it's not the same for every psychiatric disorder. Some have a higher and some have a lower. And this is a starting point. And then, as you said, we, we, which is the combination of the other factors? I, I mentioned... Uh, one recent study that is extremely interesting in this direction that has been done in, in US and Harvard, where they studied um, a subject with a very high genetic predisposition uh, for depression. But when those subjects were exposed to very protective environments, and with protective environments, I mean, of course, the usual things that everybody knows, like uh, physical exercise that is good for mood and anxiety, like uh, healthy food, uh, vegetables, uh, um, fruits uh, compared to 
foods that we know that are less healthy. So if you use all the possible environmental uh, uh, tools, uh, lifestyle, uh, food, uh, relationships, uh, and we can think also about psychotherapy, anything, well, it's interesting to see that the effects were almost completely reversed. So this is a key point uh, that is important for people to know because uh, people is, is looking like, uh, like science fiction movies uh, where the genetic prediction means 100% uh, it will happen. Uh, reality is different. There is a liability, but as you mentioned, liability can be modulated. Epigenetic is just uh, a tool. Epigenetic is, 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 is a mechanism that can silence or activate some genes on the basis of what the environment is doing. And the environment is everything, all the things that I mentioned before. So indeed, yes, genetic is a liability, but uh, this liability can be heavily modulated by the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I remember having a student many years ago who, um, mom, whose mom had anxiety and she had anxiety and she had this belief in her mind that her genes were her destiny when it came to anxiety and that she would always have it. And that was, that was it for her. Um, and it was such an interesting perspective. It was a class where we were trying, where we were teaching about lifestyle factors and their influence. Um, and she was dead set on this belief that her genes, that was it for her. So, Yes, this is indeed uh, raising uh, the issue of uh, counseling that is very important uh, because uh, when a people, people knows about uh, their, for example, liability to any kind of, of, of disorder, there is the risk of uh, the, 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 the prophecy is, is self-fulfilling. So uh, if I know that I have a risk for anxiety, I became more anxious, of course. So it's a question of vicious circle. This is why it's important that uh, professionals are able to modulate uh, these, these factors. Uh, uh, explaining and, and teaching and coaching people uh, that is not uh, a complete destiny, of course. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so that raises the question, um, because people are getting more and more genetic reports and having this really valuable information, as you know, the vast majority of our listeners are behavioral health providers. Um, what should they do if a person comes to them with a genetic report? Yes, this is uh, increasingly more common. Now, of course, when there is a scientific finding, uh, companies, they do their best interest. Uh, that is, of course, uh, working on, on, on market and profits. Uh, and therefore, uh, it, can, it can happen that uh, companies, and there are many companies at present that are offering this kind of services, uh, may uh, overstate uh, the scientific uh, uh, evidence. Uh, just to be clear, probably not everybody in the audience is, is, uh, is familiar with this topic. Uh, at present, it's possible for everybody without a medical doctor prescription to, to ship a sample of saliva, for example, in, in a small box uh, to a company, and the company extracts DNA from the saliva cells uh, and uh, performs a whole genome analysis. And then the company compares the whole genome analysis of the individual with the available knowledge, with the database. And uh, usually a very fancy uh, outcome is, is, is given back to the individual. Uh, I've seen books of um, 200 pages that are some kind of uh, individual uh, analysis to the, to the person. So first part is about uh, cardiovascular system and then you read, uh, okay, your DNA increases your risk of myocardial infarction by 20%. 
or uh, it can be the opposite. Uh, the report could say the, your genetic profile decreases the risk of myocardial infarction of, of 20% or about lung uh, cancer and, and also about psychiatry. Uh, you have a higher risk of, of Alzheimer's disease, you have a lower risk of schizophrenia and so on. Of course, I can understand that people is extremely curious about this and therefore uh, some are willing to pay in, in the range of also thousand dollars. It's not cheap, of course. Point is that uh, some of this statement can be solid, others, as we discussed before, may be uh, less solid. So this is why it's important that the professional is, is, is uh, filtering this information to give the real weight. So if, 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 if you indeed you have a gene that is increasing your myocardial infarction of, of 20%, it doesn't mean that tomorrow you will have a myocardial infarction. I've read uh, and I know that people with the, the, the risk genes of, of breast cancer, they go to um, surgery before having the, the, the breast cancer. Is it correct? Is not? Well, it should be discussed with a doctor, of course. Uh, many of these risks uh, are uh, not relevant in terms of an epidemiologic perspective. So, uh, of course, it's important to change your lifestyle. If you have a higher risk for obesity, be careful about your diet. But doesn't mean that if you don't have the risk genes for obesity, you can eat whatever you want, because at the end, the damage is there as well. And the same for psychiatric disorders. So overall, uh, I suggest the people uh, some caution in, in uh, interpreting and uh, working with this kind of uh, uh, reports that are increasingly more, more present. But this doesn't mean that they are not useful. Of course, uh, this is a very useful service to the population because the, uh, the national system is not able to offer to the whole population this kind of analysis. So, so if someone is willing to spend the 1,000 or so uh, to get this information, it can be useful. However, be aware that uh, it is uh, sometimes just a minor increase or decrease on the risk. And sometimes the evidence can change. Maybe in some report you can have a risk of, of schizophrenia and then after five years the, the, the results are a little bit different and, uh, different and then your score may not be the same. So it's important to differentiate which are the solid findings and which are the still preliminary findings that are not so solid yet. Mm -hmm. I can see the value of the report but also that you need a professional who can help you. Um, you talked about the importance of a teacher and a coach uh, when it comes to deciphering this information. And so, you know, seeing a genetic counselor or someone who has the knowledge to be able to support the translation of that information, because the report itself, I've had one, you know, it's, uh, I guess, over, like I go back to that overwhelming sense that I talked about earlier. I'm like, I don't know what this means. <laughs> I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about how genetics can inform treatment. I know this is a kind of a emerging field, I would say. Yes, yes. Oh, this is exactly uh, probably my the center of, of my research. Uh, of course, I'm working also on the genetic of, of, of the psychiatric disorders, but... Uh, the genetic of treatment is, is something that uh, I do since uh, now more than 25 years. I could say that probably we were the first in Milan to discover the pharmacogenetic of antidepressants in 1997. So uh, I think this is extremely important. And this is not only important, but is also um, available at present. So. It is clear now for the audience that we discussed that variants in the gene can create variation in the proteins that can create variations in the brain and not only in the brain. And therefore, it's, it's, it's clear and intuitive that when you take a drug, a compound, it impacts differently based on your genetic background. 
And we know that all the psychiatric uh, um, drugs that we have, uh, in psychiatry we have more than 100 uh, different uh, drugs, 40 antidepressants, uh, 30 antipsychotics, and many benzodiazepines, mood stabilizers, and so on. So each of them is useful, but none of them is perfect. So the difficulty that we clinicians have is to find the right treatment for every patient. When a patient comes to us with depression, we have to choose one out of the 41 antidepressants. Which, well, uh, at present, uh, what we are doing is based on clinical knowledge, um, comorbidity. If you have, uh, for example, diabetes, uh, I will avoid antidepressants that can uh, increase uh, weight gain, uh, and uh, a lot of uh, criteria for choosing. But they are all clinical criteria. So the ideal, the ideal scenario is to have a genetically uh, driven uh, indication for, for, for the drugs that you should be prescribed. Because what happens is in the end, you always, almost always find your right drug. But what I say to my patients at the beginning, I say, okay, I see you today for the first time. Now you have a clinical uh, picture of depression. I will do my best to find the best treatment for you. But it may take a while. It may take six months, nine months, one year, one year and a half. Because every drug should be tested for two, three, four weeks. Uh, for some person, lucky, the first is the most effective and it's working. For other persons, you have to shift, uh, to combine, uh, and then it takes months. So it would be a big improvement if we have a genetically driven prescription. At present, uh, something is already there, because genetic factors, they control also the metabolic enzymes of the liver. And we all know that all the drugs are metabolized by the liver. And so at present, we know that 20% uh, of the population are either poor metabolizer or rapid metabolizer. It means that they have a different, uh, differently active uh, liver enzymes. So it means that for 10% uh, of the population, you should use much lower doses than usual because they are uh, poor metabolizers. And if you give the normal dose, they will have a lot of side effects. And then you have the opposite of uh, very rapid metabolizers uh, where the standard dose is not effective because it is metabolized by the liver very quickly. And therefore, you should increase the dose uh, above sometimes the threshold of the label. And this is already in the label of many antidepressants. And uh, many hospitals are already doing this. Not all of them. Point is that is expensive, of course, and so not all clinicians are willing to do and to pay for it. But uh, it is already there, and it is uh, useful, practical, and 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 this is uh, a, 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 an application of genetics that we have in our clinical practice. You go to the hospital, you see if you are a poor metabolizer or rapid metabolizer, and then uh, the dose is adjusted accordingly. And this is the simple thing that is already there. The most complex uh, is the so-called pharmacodynamic uh, analysis. That means the genes that modulate your brain structures. So, uh, if, for example, you are taking an antidepressant. Antidepressants are serotonin reuptake inhibitors, the most common, that inhibit the reuptake of serotonin and increase serotonin in your brain. But you can have different serotoninergic receptors in your brain from a genetic perspective. And therefore, some of these compounds may be more useful for you or less useful. Maybe you need an noradrenergic antidepressant. Maybe the serotoninergic are not working because, just as an example, your serotoninergic receptors are less plastic and they, they plasticity, they lack of plasticity, and therefore they do not adapt to the compound. And this is the frontier that we all in the world are working to try to understand which are the genes that modify the brain structures that in turn modify your uh, response and tolerability to uh, antidepressants, antipsychotics, and mood stabilizers. So this is uh, what uh, is uh, already here, what uh, we are working on. On this, there are many companies that are already selling. Uh, uh, in the last paper, we counted about 
54 companies worldwide that are already selling the prediction of efficacy of antidepressant or antipsychotic. Again, like I said a few minutes ago, some of the information on this prediction is sound, like the one about the pharmacokinetic uh, liver enzymes. Some information about the pharmacodynamic variation in the brain is less stable at present. And therefore, all the society, like for example the Psychiatric Genetic Society, are suggesting the population to be careful about interpreting and working on this uh, uh, data at present. And then uh, there is a possible impact in the future. All this uh, knowledge about the genes uh, can uh, allow us to use new treatments that are not used now for psychiatry. For example, some of the genes and proteins that we identify as uh, risk factors for schizophrenia or, or depression can be modulated by compounds that are used in other fields of medicine, like diabetes, for example. And this is called the drug repurposing. There are out there 5,000 drugs that may be they impact on some uh, um, genes and proteins that are relevant for psychiatry. And this is a, a field that is uh, receiving a lot of interest because you don't need a new drug. You just repurpose a drug that is already used for something else in psychiatry. And then there is the last stage, uh, that is the knowledge of the genes that are involved in schizophrenia or bipolar or depression. And then you can target these genes or even change those genes. On this, of course, we must be extremely careful because uh, uh, this is probably the future and I'm not even sure that in 50 years we will get there. But just to tell the population, it is possible to get there. If you know that you have one malfunctioning gene that gives you liability, for example, to the amygdala, then anxiety disorder, you can target this gene with some tools or you can change the gene. It is possible now we have the technology to change uh, genes in, in living individuals. Of course this is extremely dangerous because when you change a gene you don't know which is the possible cascade of events. You can do some damage, create cancer or whatever. Of course it must be very well studied but in theory this is possible and it would, could be the definite uh, definitive treatment for the psychiatric disorder because current treatments let's remember that they modulate the disorder but they don't cure at the basis it's not like antibiotics for pneumonia antibiotics kill bacteria that gives you pneumonia and then you heal completely in, in, in schizophrenia and depression we are just modulating as much as possible with the drugs and psychotherapy but the underlying cause we cannot change unless we change the, the genetic structure. Hmm. This may be a really silly question, um, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Um, has there been any research done to understand if different psychotherapies influence genes in any way? Yes, this is a very common uh, discussion uh, uh, among uh, doctors, uh, psychiatrists, uh, psychologists, psychotherapists. Uh, and in the past, it was also a kind of a fight uh, who was supporting the psychotherapy, who was supporting the biological approach. In the 60s, in the 70s, particularly in the US and Europe, there was a big debate about that. Well, at present, we, we know that the situation uh, is uh, that everybody is right and everybody is wrong because uh, um, indeed both drugs and psychotherapy at the end uh, achieve the same effect with different pathways. When you take an antidepressant, you increase plasticity, you increase activity in some brain areas. When you do psychotherapy, with a top-down mechanism that is linked with the psychotherapy process, you change the same structures. So at the end, the outcome is the same. This is why at present uh, it is always uh, suggested and uh, to combine drugs and psychotherapy. That is by far the most effective uh, uh, strategy because 
you face the problem in both direction bottom up with the drug that changed the mechanics and molecules and the top down with the psychotherapy that changes the pathway of activation of the frontal cortex and limbic system so which is the best psychotherapy this is a very challenging question of course the psychotherapies that we use uh, currently are the most easy to 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 use cbt cognitive behavioral therapy it is practical it is easy to train you can do in two three four six months psychoanalytic uh, the psychoanalytic treatment uh, it is extremely more expensive it can take up to five ten years sometimes more three four times a week so it is much more challenging it is difficult to study some people say that with psychoanalysis you can change deeply your brain structure in your functioning and your disease but it's difficult to study there are no many studies because you can understand that a 10 year long treatment is difficult to study personally but this is my just personal opinion i believe that psychoanalysis this very long and intensive treatment is useful not in all disorders uh, not in the most severe not in the psychotic disorder probably but it's very expensive and, 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 and burdensome for, 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 for the person. And the other psychotherapies are overall, in my experience, very similar. Interpersonal, cognitive, behavioral. Uh, they can be targeted on the, on the need of the person. But they change the brain in the same way that drugs change the brain, just with a different mechanism. Mm -hmm. Well, and going back to originally talking about lifestyle, you know, physical activity and um, healthy foods, that those are a key component as well that sometimes can be overlooked when we look at mental health. Yes, maybe if you want, I can briefly discuss this. There is a very huge interest at present on this in the so-called microbiome that are the bacteria that we have in the gut, and they are extremely important because uh, the so-called junk food is promoting uh, the so-called bad bacteria in your gut. And these bad bacteria, what they do? They produce, uh, let's say, uh, bad substances, to be simple, like uh, pro-inflammatory substances and so on. And they put the individual in, in, in a state of... Uh, 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 anhedonia, uh, insomnia, anxiety. On the opposite, uh, uh, healthy food like uh, vegetables, fruit, uh, um, some fishes and so on, they promote uh, uh, good bacteria. And the good bacteria reduce the inflammatory state of the bowel and the entire body and therefore also the brain. So there is a very uh, bidirectional clear uh, communication between the gut and the brain and the bacteria and the gut and the brain so the, there is now increasing evidence that healthy food is changing the bacteria in the gut that in turn is changing the functioning of the brain in the direction of anti-anxiety antidepressant yeah thank you for mentioning that um it's amazing all that we continue to learn, right? You're talking about what, we, what we're pretty solid on, what we know, and that some of these findings we have to take with a grain of salt until more research is conducted and there's more data to be able to decipher through. Um, it's, it's, I, I find it fun and interesting, but I can imagine some people might find it frustrating and like, okay, why do I even care? <laughs> So, um, what do you see for the future of genetics? Well, the future uh, is uh, a combination of the things that we already discussed in the past minutes. Uh, um, I see that uh, when the discoveries will continue to pile up and we will have more and more information, all this information will be used in uh, everyday clinical practice. You probably know that uh, at present many hospitals in the US, but also in Europe and Asia and uh, many other countries are using the so-called electronic health records. 
in the past uh, we used to write uh, the paper charts of the patient that was uh, typically quite a nightmare for us writing and for other people reading because doctors usually don't write very well <laughs> so it was an issue that is going on since many years but with electronic health record this is solved but electronic health record is not just uh, something that is uh, comfortable and useful uh, reproducible and easy to find uh, much easier than paper record of course but can be combined and therefore genetic is uh, now starting to be included into electronic health records so uh, the typical picture is that uh, you go to a hospital and then the doctors uh, can access your uh, of course with permission your electronic health record and they can see oh, okay mr smith i see that uh, you had uh, some surgical procedure you had some um, pneumonia whatever you had a depression two years ago and i see also that you did a genetic analysis and you are a poor metabolizer therefore i will prescribe you uh, a lower doses of the antidepressant so this clinical situation is something that could not happen without genetic without electronic health record and it improves a lot the quality of the care because if you don't know anything, you have to start every time from zero. Patients not always bring with them uh, previous uh, uh, prescriptions, uh, previous also because they can get lost uh, or they can be difficult to read or anything. With electronic health record, we can incorporate genetics for every doctor that is treating you. And this is the very first important step. And then there is a second one that is very common these days. Everybody is talking on the newspaper. That is artificial intelligence. Point is that uh, um, at present, the information is too much for us doctors. You have to think that when a patient comes to a psychiatrist in a hospital, whatever, you have to look at all the clinical features. How are you? Which is your mood? How do you sleep? And so on. And then you have to see all the medical aspects as well. We are doctors. And so you have to see all the blood um, analysis uh, some basic genetic analysis uh, you have to know all the previous medical diseases a person has diabetes uh, or maybe had hypertension uh, and information is a lot is too much probably for a human mind and, and you don't have time or, or you can forget uh, i always tell to my residents uh, you have to ask everything. Don't be shy. Just keep uh, a list on your desk. Because if you forget something and you don't know something, you can do some damage. And therefore, artificial intelligence uh, could do this work for us. So when you access the electronic health record, uh, you talk with the patient, you collect your psychiatric information, and then uh, the, the system, the software, tells you, oh, be careful because this person uh, has hypertension. You are uh, uh, prescribing, uh, for example, venlafaxine. And venlafaxine is an antidepressant that is increasing blood pressure. Are you sure that you want to prescribe this? It's just a warning. It's not that artificial intelligence is substituting the doctor. No, mm -hmm. not yet at least. <laughs> Probably not in the next 50 years. But artificial intelligence can underline something for you and to avoid you to do mistakes. Mm -hmm. and, and in the future, the, the far future, of course, we can do this gene therapy that is already done in some uh, hematological uh, uh, fields, but this is probably much further than, than we will live. Wonderful. Thank you. Um... As we wrap up, I wonder if there's anything else that you feel like is important for our listeners to know or understand. Well, my suggestion is that uh, first not to be frightened by things. What I always see in 30 years that I'm going around worldwide, I, I see that some people is frightened. No, no, I genetics. I don't want to hear about it. Why? Is something that can be useful 
It's not something that is terrible, that is completely changing the world. It's just one another another piece of information. So I would suggest people uh, um, to be curious and then maybe to refer, of course, to serious sources, uh, uh, not just to the first web page that you can find, just to, to have some lay information that can inform you about what, what things are doing, like what we are doing today here, it is possible to find similar sources of information. So, don't be scared about genetics, uh, um, don't be over-enthusiastic about genetics, it's just something, it's just a, a piece of information that can help uh, people and, and, and doctors. I love that, yeah. I really see how genes are our foundation for um, health, and there's so many different pieces, right? We talked about the environment, we talked about lifestyle, uh, microbiome, like there's so much complexity and pieces of this puzzle and genes are a really important piece for us to know and understand moving forward and will inform more precision medicine in the future, which is exciting. Exactly, exactly. Your, your summary is perfect. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you joining us today, Dr. Soretti. It's been a joy, and I I don't feel quite as overwhelmed and scared about genes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for interviewing. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Cassatt Conversations, your resource for exploring behavioral health topics. We hope you found today's conversation timely and meaningful. Please share this podcast with your friends and colleagues. If you want to learn more, visit us at our blog at cassatteondemand.org. Cassatt Podcast Network. This podcast has been brought to you by the Cassatt Podcast Network, located within the Center for the Application of Substance Abuse Technologies, a part of the School of Public Health at the University of Nevada, Reno. For more podcast information and resources, visit cassatt.org.